If you have your Bibles, can you turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. So we're going to have a reading from verse 28 to 48, Luke chapter 19, 28 to 48, and Micah is very graciously going to come and read it to us. Luke 19, 28, and then keep your Bibles open. After Jesus had said this, he went ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead uh, went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem, and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. That's great. Thanks, Mike. Keep your Bibles open, and let's just come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we realize the words that Jesus said, that without you we can do nothing, and we really do believe that. We pray now for our dependence upon you, for your Spirit to come and reveal truth to us, that we might be changed people as we listen to you. Take all the attention, all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're coming towards the end of our series in Luke's Gospel. We've been looking at the words that Jesus said, uh, because the words he himself is the word. John, in his Gospel, refers to Jesus as the word. So as we come to this very, very familiar passage, we realize that actually God the Father had a problem because somehow God the Father, in order to fulfill this prophecy in Zechariah, which Luke does mention in this passage, somehow God the Father had to get his son Jesus to the people in Jerusalem. Now, because he's God, he can do anything. He could have done a, a major zap down 
beam me down Scotty type approach, the whole of Jerusalem seeing, and of course the religious leaders were always trying to get him to do some incredible, amazing thing to convince them. But no, God chooses the donkeys of this world to do his work. Because his glory he will not share with anyone. And so, although God could do something spectacular, he does it through humble means. But this donkey actually had to come with four conditions before Jesus could actually use him. Before God the Father could get his son Jesus to the people, this donkey had to meet four conditions. The first one is he had to be redeemed. In the Old Testament, there are 649 laws because God's laws cover every part of life, whether it's the boundary between your house and another house or whether it's to do with food you eat. But there was actually a law about donkeys. Now, I know they often say the law is an ass, but this really is there. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 13 says this, Every firstling of a donkey, donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break his neck. That's in the Bible. Exodus 13, verse 13, a law covering donkeys. The whole idea there, as you see from that verse, is that the donkey to be alive had to be redeemed with the life of a lamb. The whole idea is substitution. Something taking the place of something else. So the guy that had a donkey had a simple choice. It was either a lamb or the donkey. If he wanted the donkey to live, and it's right there in black and white in your Bible, Exodus 13, 13, if he wanted his donkey to live, he had to kill a lamb so that donkey could live. It's a choice. If he wasn't prepared to kill the lamb, then the donkey had to die. Death had to happen to one or the other. And as we come to this Friday, Good Friday, and this whole Easter weekend we're approaching, is it no wonder that John the Baptist saw Jesus and called him the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? You see, for a holy God, sin is absolutely unthinkable. Sin has to be punished. Sin, the Bible says, has to be punished by death because the wages of sin is death. Something has to die for the sin that you and I commit as we are sinners before God. Something has to go. It's either us or a substitute. And this glorious time we're coming into over the Easter weekend, but of course there's never a day we don't thank the Lord for it, Jesus was prepared as the Lamb of God to die for the sin that we deserve, for the punishment that we deserve. And that's why John the Baptist, Jesus, the very first words recorded in Mark's Gospel, Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. Believe the Gospel. Repent of your sin, and then the blood of the Lamb of God can actually have its effect on our lives. We either take the punishment of our sin or we say thank you to God for taking it on Jesus. That donkey we had to be redeemed. A lamb had to die for that donkey to live. What good is a dead donkey? Jesus couldn't ride a dead donkey. So for God the Father to get his son to the people, that donkey had to be redeemed by a lamb dying in its place. Great story, isn't there, of Hosea in the Old Testament, a prophet who got married, but his wife was unfaithful to him. And she went off with various men, and as he was walking through the marketplace one day, there he saw her being sold as a slave. He bought her back. That is redemption. Buying back that which was originally his. Paying the price. And the good news of Easter, the good news of the gospel, is that Jesus, the Lamb of God, has paid the price that we should pay because none of us can deserve 
or earn our place in God's family. Let me put this another way. Three other ways of explaining the gospel. So we have the idea of redemption, the substitution, the Lamb of God dying in our place, only effective when we repent of that sin. Let me give you three other ways of explaining. We have the idea of scapegoat. In the Old Testament, one of the things that uh, the people of Israel had to do was to bring a goat to the priest, and he would literally lay his hands on the goat and pass symbolically the sin of the people onto that goat. The goat was then driven into the desert where it would die. It would die bearing the sin of the people. The Lamb of God, the scapegoat. If you go to St. Paul's Cathedral, Holman Hunt has painted a picture of the scapegoat. Jesus, the scapegoat. (coughs) Somebody who gets blamed for something he never did. Let me give another illustration. For years and years and years, I had a whole string of motorbikes. Started off with a Lambretta, as you do, work your way up into the different things until I got my dream of a Honda Goldwing. And um, one Easter, it was actually after the Easter uh, weekend, I was going up the M6 on my motorbike to actually prepare for a, a youth week that we were going to do as PBC up in the Lake District of the YMCA, up there canoeing and basically killing ourselves. It was the time, joyfully, I think, that Adrian fell off his horse and gave us enormous, enormous joy. But anyway, that was that week. That was that week that we went up to the Lake District. And I was merrily going up the M6, king of the road on my big bike, Going, heading up to YMCA in the Lake District, and suddenly, out of nowhere, I saw a police jeep pulling alongside me. And there was a police woman, and she, I, I thought she was waving at me. I thought, oh, perhaps she fancies me. She was waving, but in fact, when I looked a bit closer, she was telling me to pull in. So we pulled into the hard shoulder, so it clearly wasn't a smart waterway. Pulled, pulled into the, into the hard a hard shoulder. She got out of the police jeep and came over to me, told me to take my helmet off. She said, I noticed that you haven't got a tax disc on your, on your bike. Now, by t- I tell you, she must have the best eyesight ever because in the days when you had to have tax discs, it's literally on the hub of the front wheel. She must have had eagle eyes to notice that. And it was true, I didn't. Some mangy kid at school had pinched it because I put him in detention. <clears throat> and he got his revenge by nicking my license. But I said, don't worry, don't worry. So I went to my pannier and I got out a letter from the DVLA. It's always the Welsh the tax, isn't it? So I got this letter from the DVLA and I said, yes, I know I haven't got a tax this, but I wrote to Swansea. And I explained, said, look at your records, you see that I've paid, and they sent me a letter to cover me. I said, look, I'm covered. I know I'm guilty because there isn't a tax tax disc, but I am covered because the price has been paid. That's the gospel. We are covered in Jesus because the price has been paid. Let me give you one more illustration of the gospel. The Bible is so good in the way way it gives us these metaphors and understandings to really grip on the gospel. We live in a world where there are many kingdoms. They live side by side. They exist together, but they are totally different. So we have the human kingdom, and we have the animal kingdom, we have the plant kingdom, three separate kingdoms living side by side but different. So if I really fancied that I wanted to be a bird and have a bird's eye view of the world, if I ate budgie seed every day for breakfast for two weeks, I would not become a bird. Because if I want to be a bird, I had to be born a bird. So these kingdoms are different, and that's why Jesus said you have to be born again. By nature, we do not belong to the kingdom of God. We are in the kingdom of darkness, and that transfer to the kingdom of light is a miracle that only the Holy Spirit can do. We need to be born into the kingdom. 
Now, poor Nicodemus really thought it was all a physical thing. It had to be done. No, because we can't do it ourselves. That's the whole point. It's a miracle that God does. And Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Let me ask you a question. Are you born again? You can sit in your nice, comfy PBC chair, but are you born again? Are you redeemed? Do you have two birthdays a year? Born twice. See, for God the Father to get his son to the people in Jerusalem, that donkey had to be redeemed. So it was alive. You can use a live donkey, but there was another problem, another condition this donkey had to meet. It had to be released. Key verse in our passage is verse 30. Do you see there in verse 30? It said that this donkey was alive, but tied. Now I ask you, what good is a stupid donkey that's alive, but tied up? Still a problem for the father to get his son to the people. Tied. And you see, we can be born again, the Spirit, we can be redeemed, we can be part of God's family, but there's an area in our lives in which we're so tied, we're totally useless to man and beast and to God. We could be tied up in hatred, in unforgiveness. We could be tied up in an area of our lives. What about pornography? There's an area of our lives that tie us down that God the Father cannot use us to get his son to the people. Let me give you an example in the Bible. Do you remember Peter, the Apostle Peter? A great man, a leader of the church, an apostle, wrote two books in the New Testament. In his very first preach, 3,000 people came to know Jesus. He was the Billy Graham of his day. But he had a major problem. The great apostle Peter, the great preacher, the great evangelist. Do you know why he was tied? He hated Gentiles. He particularly hated the Romans who were occupying his country and he had to pay tax to. A great spiritual leader, but there was an area that really tied him down. He needed to be released. But did you notice with this donkey, again verse 30 is a key issue here, we cannot untie ourselves. Jesus says in verse 30, key verse, he says there is a donkey that's tied, go and untie it. The donkey was helpless to untie itself. It needed to be untied. Similar situation with Lazarus. Been dead for three, four days. Jesus did the miracle and brought him back to life. He was alive. That donkey was alive, but both of them were tied. Jesus said to the people around with Lazarus, go and untie him. He was still bound by grave clothes. I'm helping another church at the moment work through an issue that is completely splitting the church because people are coming in with their background their nice cozy formulated background of what they've been brought up in and is causing havoc they are bound they are tied to tradition they're bound by things and God cannot use people who are tied yeah you're born again You know all the evangelical words. You know all the lingo. You sing the songs. You can quote memory verses you learned in Sunday school. But maybe we're tied. All sorts of things can tie us down. This donkey we had to be redeemed in order for God the Father to get his son to the people. This donkey had to be released so that he could be used by God to fulfill that purpose. But thirdly, this donkey had to relinquish something. Do you know what he had to do? He had to relinquish control. Boy, that's the tough one, isn't it? 
relinquish control. Notice again, verse 30, this donkey had never been broken in. Nobody had ever ridden this donkey before. It was not used to people telling it what to do. It had to let the master control it. I remember talking to a member of staff in the staff room once and saying how she needed to come to the Lord and she said, I will never let anyone, even God, control my life. Fits in with what Luke chapter 10 says, we will not have this man reign over us. An area of our lives is there, Lord, you can have anything you like, but... Just imagine for a moment, though, think about it. That little donkey was used to a quiet life. It was from a village. It only knew the few people around it. And here suddenly were some weird people with a northern accent, because they were from Galilee, coming in and they'd never, never seen these people, never heard them before. And suddenly they were taking it away from its comfort zone and into the capital city where there were hundreds and hundreds of people making stupid noise, singing and shouting down his ear hole, waving these silly branches around in front of it. If I'd been that donkey, I would have legged it. But it was completely submissive to the control of Jesus Christ. For God the Father to take his son to the people it had to come alive and it had to be redeemed, it had to be released, and it had to relinquish control. We holding on to it? You know, we sing that song, Silver and Gold, Have I None? Uh, none, none, nothing that I have will I withhold. A lot of nonsense, really, isn't it? Submission. We will never know the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Ironically, submission is the only way to joy. It goes totally contrary to our way of thinking. Submission is the best way. Let's go back to the story of Peter on the roof. So here he was. No, 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 don't be silly. Not that Peter. That's Peter Parker. Not that one. Peter the Apostle. He's on the roof waiting for the Peter delivery guy to come along. And while he's there on the roof, he has this vision, this trance of a sheet coming down from heaven. And the voice says, Peter, kill and eat. Now, hang on, hang on, hang on, he says. I've been brought up in my nice, cozy world. There are certain things I can't eat, and you're saying I've got to eat them. So entrenched in his way of life, here was God trying to release him. Do you know what he said? Three words. Recorded in your Bible as well, he said, not so, Lord. What a contradiction. He had the right word, the right phraseology. He calls Jesus Lord. You know, you go to some churches and they have the big plaque, Jesus is Lord. Fine to put it up on a wall, harder to live it out on a Monday morning. He said, no, Lord, I'm not going to do it. That goes against what I've been brought up to do. That goes against the grain. That goes away everything that I read about until God had to do it three times because we're so slow to hear him, so slow to take it in. And then it caught none. Peter, there's a guy at the front door and there's a guy down the road. He is a Gentile. He is a Roman centurion the kind of people you absolutely hate, and he longs to know me. And you're saying no. But you know the joy is, when he submitted, 
to God against everything he thought and loved and believed was right when he submitted to God and he went to Cornelius. Not only Cornelius was converted, his entire household as well. See, when we're tied, what can God do? When we live wanting to control what we do, control our money, control our time, control everything, what can God do? For this donkey to be used by God the Father to take the people, Jesus to the people, he had to be redeemed. He had to be released. He had to relinquish control to the master. And then the fourth condition was this. He had to reflect all the attention and all the glory to Jesus. Who did they shout Hosanna to? Was it the donkey? Do you find anything in your Bible that says, oh, the people flocked around the little donkey? No. He doesn't even get a word, doesn't get a mention. He's not on the front page of evangelicals now. He's totally forgotten. Why? Because rightly so, all the attention was on Jesus. I sometimes ask myself, why do Christians sometimes write books? Is it to get into the evangelical world and to be known? Why do they get a doctorate? Is it because in the doctor of theology they'll be known? Do you see why Jesus chose a donkey and not a, a white stallion that all the heroes ride in, in, the, in their films, in the movies? Just like the moon doesn't have a light of its own, it reflects the sun. So you and I are asked to reflect God's glory. John the Baptist had a great attitude, didn't he? He must increase and I must decrease. Radiating Jesus and not ourselves. So here were the conditions then for God the Father to get his son Jesus to the crowds. That donkey had to be redeemed. A lamb had to die. That donkey had to be released. It had to be prepared to relinquish control to Jesus the Master. Completely out of his comfort zone. That donkey had to reflect all the attention to Jesus. There were Three reactions, you know, to that crowd. Did you notice it as, we're, as Mike was reading the passage a moment ago? So here is Jesus now on the donkey riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And there were three reactions to Jesus. First of all, verse 47. Have a look at it. It's in your Bible too. Every day, Jesus was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the traders and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Do you know what people do when they're uncomfortable with something they're hearing? They switch it off. Somebody said to me this week, I'm so fed up with the news, I don't listen to it anymore. They don't like what they're hearing, so they switch it off. When we don't like what God is saying, we switch off. And that's what these people, they wanted to kill him because they didn't like his message. They wanted to silence him. They wanted to kill him. It was rejection. It was an act of rejection. And we can come to church, you know what? We can come to church and still hear the gospel and still deliberately reject the gospel message. The second reaction was in verse 45. Have a look at it in your Bible. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. The second reaction was a religious reaction. Here these guys were in the temple. Were they worshipping? No. Were they praying? No. What were they doing? Making money. They were so involved in their ritual that they were not in a relationship with God. And because they were not in a relationship with God, they couldn't worship. 
there are hundreds of, probably thousands of people in this country at this very moment in church. Every Sunday they go through the same ritual, but they don't know God. I had to take the funeral of one of my students from school. She had committed suicide, and it was in a, a local church. And the vicar said to me before I went, and he said, don't preach the gospel, don't be true to the Bible. I said, I'm sorry, mate, if I'm preaching, I'm going to be true to truth. Ritual and religion will not make you right with God. That was their, that was their thing. They, were so, they thought everything was fine, but they were ritualistic. Do you know what? What is really funny, that donkey was more savvy than those religious leaders. The donkey knew who Jesus was, but they didn't. But both religion and ritual end up the same way. It leads to judgment. Have a look at verse 39. 39 says this, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you even had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming in you, to you. Rejection, and if you walk out of here today without being right with God, that is rejection. Rejection and ritual only bring judgment. Just 40 years after Jesus said those words, those words, AD 70, the Romans completely sacked Jerusalem. The temple has never been rebuilt since then. Judgment. So, what is the reaction to Jesus? Well, it can be rejection. It can be simply making, trying to make right with God by ritual and religion. But there is a third reaction, that's the response. Look at verse 48. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on Jesus' words. There are those who respond to Jesus. Right now, our title is The Words of Jesus. There has to be a response. Doing nothing is still a response to God. As the chorus says, what will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. One day your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Recognizing God's coming. But you see, recognizing Jesus isn't enough. Even the demons recognize Jesus. Remember those times he went to somebody to take the demon out? The demon said, get away, we know you're the son of God. So recognizing him is not enough. We have to repent. We have to repent of the sin and then be saved. John, in his gospel, put it this way, but as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of God to those who believe in his name. The Bible says the response time is right now. The day of salvation is today. That's what the Bible says. Not tomorrow when it's convenient. Today. It starts off with recognizing who Jesus is. It then goes on to repentance. When we know who he is, we repent in humility for the sin that put him on the cross. And then we receive him by faith in our hearts. Today is the time for response. Quite a lot of times I've gone to a pub in Stubbington because I meet up there with the guys I used to teach. And I talk to them about Jesus and there's one guy in there called Tom, and I said to him, Tom, why don't you give your life to Jesus? He can do so much more in your life than you can. Oh, he said, I'm going to wait till I'm 25. Isn't this funny, the notion that people have that God is a killjoy? 
I'm going to have a good time in there, then I'll give my life to Jesus. Hey, mate, here he is the source of joy. Well, a little time afterwards, one of the lads in the class, in that same class, died of cancer, 21 years of age. The family asked me to take the funeral. And we were all standing around the grave, all these lads in the same class. And we were looking down six foot at the coffin in the ground. Tom was standing next to me. The guy who had died was 21 years of age. And I said to him, are you going to still wait till you're 25? The Bible says today is the time to respond. Well, God solved his problem of getting his son Jesus to the people. He found it in that donkey because that donkey had been redeemed. It was alive because a lamb had died in his place. He was released so he could be used by the master. He was willing to relinquish all control so that Jesus controlled him. And he reflected all the attention to Jesus. But you know, God still has a problem today. God still has a problem because somehow tomorrow morning he's got to get his son Jesus into your block of flats. You know those people you lived with? Somehow... God the Father has to get his son Jesus into your street, into your community, into your neighborhood, maybe even into your home. Now, because he's God, he can do anything. He could appear on every TV channel at once. He could do something amazing so all the world see him. But he he looks for donkeys. People who aren't full of themselves. People who don't want to bring attention to themselves. But in order for God the Father to get his son into your home, into your place of worship, into your place of work, into your office, into wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, in order for God to do that, you have to be redeemed. What's the point in telling people of a God you don't even know yourself? Dead people are no good to God. Brought alive because the Lamb has died in our place. But you need to be released. Released maybe over fear of people. Released over opening your mouth. We all talk because we all talk about the weather. Why can't we talk about Jesus? Released over fear. Released over something, I don't know. We have to be prepared to relinquish control and come under his lordship. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples about the donkey? Tell the owner the Lord needs him. Because he is the Lord, Jesus Christ. But we have to be prepared to give him all the attention. I love the strap line we used to have as a church, pointing people to Jesus. All we are is signposts. That's all. We point people to him and not to ourselves. Do you remember the story of Naaman in the Old Testament? He was, a, a, he was the second in command in his country, second only to the king. He was the army commander. Very high and important man in his country. The country of Syria. Amazing how history never changes. Syria is still the enemy of Israel. But there he was, the, 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 the commander of Israel, uh, sort of Syrian's army. And he often used to make raids into Israel. And on one raid, he took one little girl as his slave. She's so humanly insignificant, we don't even know her name, but not insignificant to God. But this great man who was so powerful, one day realized he had leprosy. His whole life was gone. All gone pear-shaped. All the power, all the influence gone because he had leprosy. But you know that little girl? She said one sentence. She went to the wife, she says, I know a man who could cure your husband. And through that one sentence, he went off to see Elisha, and under the power of God, he was cured of leprosy. One sentence. She hadn't even been to Bible college. One sentence. A great friend of mine, Bob Shull, 
from Reston Bible Church, being the youth pastor there for donkey's years. He, now I realize he's now being made the pastor of evangelism. He has a friend who was checking into an airport one day, and as he came up to the desk, he handed over his ticket, and the, uh, the attendant said, oh, I see that your final destination is Chicago. He said, no, it isn't. Oh, she said, well, it says on your ticket, your final destination is Chicago. He said, no, no, it isn't. My final destination is heaven. And with a whole lot of cursing people queuing behind him, he led that attendant to faith in Jesus Christ. All it takes is this, which every single one of us use every single day. You see, it's not ability God's looking for. It's availability. I can honestly think of no greater joy in life than talking to other people about Jesus. It absolutely thrills you. He's looking for donkeys. But you're going to be redeemed. You had to be to the cross and accept in repentance the blood that the Lamb of God slain for you. You have to be released. You're tied up about something in your life. You have to be released. You have to relinquish all control to him and realize the joy of submission. And you have to be prepared to give him all the attention. Walk away. Let everyone talk about him and not you. I love the poems of Amy Carmichael. She was a missionary to India. And one of the ones, one of the words she said was this. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me your fuel, flame of God. Let's pray. Father, your word hits us where nothing else can reach. We now step back into the shadows and let you do your work. Amen.